All right, let's transition to major league. We're transitioning to the miscellaneous department and all things outside the NBA, as we've been discussing. I was able to watch Novak Djokovic win his 19th career major. He was able to earn the French Open, defeating Cipitas in the finals after beating Nadal in a classic semifinal. I've been saying for the past two years, I think that Djokovic is, at least in this current generation, the greatest tennis player of all time. And if you listen to our show in the past, you know my big rule. I don't like doing all-time lists and putting players on it until they're retired from playing in their respective sport. That's why the whole LeBron James, where he ranks all-time compared to Michael Jordan or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Bill Russell, you, you can put him in that conversation or Kobe or Shaq or Duncan, all that stuff. All those guys I mentioned are retired. Their careers are set. They're finished. You can go from there. You can't necessarily do that with LeBron. He still has years to play. We'll see when when he finishes. Does he win another championship? Does he not even make it to the playoffs again? We don't know. Same thing with you know, with Jokovic, though. 19 majors that puts him one behind Nadal and Federer, who have 20 career majors in their career. But he has won. He has career slam twice. So that means he's won at least two French Wimbledon, Australian, and U.S. Opens in his career. He's beaten Nadal twice at the French Open, which is in Nadal's playground. But he's beaten Federer multiple times at Wimbledon, which is Federer's best you know, surface or, or the grass. So you look at the breakdown of the current generation, I think he's the best of all time. Now, is his game as, is his game as fluid and beautiful to watch? As Federer, not necessarily. This is defensive skills and just his tenacity and, and a dogged effort as strong as Nadal's, not necessarily. But I think you look at all the combinations, his flexibility, his durability, his ability to hit off both hands, his, his, his a drop volley game, they're all at an elite level. And plus, as I said, he has winning records against Federer and Nadal at majors when it really matters. And he's won at all the surfaces. And you look at what he was able to do with Nadal win that win that contest in the semifinals, able to break him multiple times. Sipitas dropping the first two sets of that final and able to make, a, make his comeback, win some tiebreakers, and find his way to winning that final. I mean, Novak is a special, special player. Does he have some kind of ticks with them that you don't like? He's that way he serves the ball with like it seems like a hundred drop of uh, bouncing of the ball before he serves. That's a little bit annoying. Uh, he's temperamental on the court. That could be a little not easy to watch, but on the court, awesome player and he's just a brilliant player right now. And you look at what's happening right now. Uh, Nadal this morning just announced he's not going to play Wimbledon and he's not going to play in Tokyo for the Olympics because he wants to, I guess, just keep get himself healthy. You got to wonder how many majors he has left in him. You look at Federer, he pulled, he withdrew from the French Open after I think, winning his fourth round contest. And he played a tournament recently. He lost in the second round, a grass tournament. First time he's done that, I think, in a very long time in his career. So you got to wonder how many majors he has left in his career. I, I think it's very possible this could be Federer's last year playing on the tour, at least on a consistent basis. I mean, he could cherry pick some majors, but as far as being a major contender, I don't know about that. And Djokovic, I think, has about two, three prime years left in his career. He can get to 24 or 25 hypothetically. And if he does that, that'll really put him at a very advantageous spot when you're looking at the greatest players of all time. But it's just brilliant seeing him play. I was awesome to see that. I have been following Major League Baseball and trying to regulate the doctoring of baseballs by pitchers with the rosin or the pine tar, the sunscreen, all this other stuff. I think the timing of it is not the best. When you have the players and even fans I'm listening to, well, first of all, I think, is this an issue? Yes. If you're doctoring baseballs or altering them and influencing them as far as pitchers, 
to have an advantage over the hitters and increase spin rate to make the ball more difficult to hit. Is that an issue? Yes, because that does affect the, I don't say the integrity of the game, but it does alter the playing of the game. I completely understand that. But the approach to it in the middle of your regular season is not wise. You have these pitchers that are, and I know Tyler Graskow, the pitcher from the Rays, he said that him having to use different substances to grip the ball or to get more grip on the ball, he had to throw the ball differently. And unfortunately for him, it led to a partial tear of his elbow ligament, which could lead to Tommy John surgery, which could put him out for a very long time. And he's one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball, so you don't want to see that. I don't know if that's the ultimate reason because of having to use different grip of the use instead of using pine tar or using a rosin and sunscreen and some other things guys have been using him having to alter it cause that elbow injury. It's kind of similar to what I was saying with the NBA injuries are part of the game. It's going to happen, but I'm not an expert in that, but I will say this. It's just not good timing having this should have been done in the off season during spring training, getting the pitchers used to being with these regulations of what they can use and not use. You Now you have these umpires who are supposed to be the ultimate judges of this. They're not completely trained on it. Yes, I mean, I'm sure they know what, what substances are being used and everything like that, but to make them the ultimate doctor or the ultimate judges in this, in the middle of a game to cause ejections, which will ultimately lead to a 10-game uh, 10 suspension and not being able to re- – they get paid, the players, but as then the manager or the front office can't replace that player on the roster. It, it, just to do this in the middle of June, and, and you're really – and I know they said they've done years of research on this and looking at the spin rates and the altering of the balls and everything like that, but this all started early June, and with June 17th we're talking right now, the players are supposed to have all of this fixed by June 21st when it's supposed to regulate all these things. I just think the timing of it is very bad. This is something that you probably should have either do it this off season or wait till this uh, do it this past off season or really enforce it this off season, upcoming off season. But I just think to do this in the middle of the season and it brings negative attention. Uh, to the game. It's just not very smart. Uh, but we'll see what happens over the next few weeks when this starts happening and these rules are supposed to be enforced and we'll have some more commentary on it. Very beginnings of Euro Championships and Copa America, we're in the, the group stages, so nothing really too surprising is coming out. I'm watching Denmark and Belgium. Uh, the Danes lead 1-0 on Belgium in the second half. Yeah, the Christian Eriksen uh, cardiac events. I was watching that live, just very, very scary, seeing them having to having to literally resuscitate him. And we do know now uh, the Denmark player, that if you're, n- you're not familiar with the European Championships, uh, they were playing, and uh, uh, your, Christian Eriksen, one of the Denmark players, collapsed a- in the middle of the contest on the field and had a cardiac event, and they had to resuscitate him, literally. They did CPR and some other revival treatments on him. Thankfully, they were able to revive him, and he was, uh, you know, sent to the hospital and is currently under evaluations and treatment and resting and all of that stuff. But it happened in the middle of the game, and you saw the reaction of the players that are around him. His Denmark players or his teammates formed a, a human shield around him so that the cameras really couldn't get an angle. But you can see through those players that they were performing CPR on him. You saw a lot of the fans in the stands crying, very emotional. Because we may have seen a fatality in the middle of a contest, and that would have been, we, we, we say a lot of things are tragic and a disaster, and, uh, and we use those terms in sports when a team loses a ball game or if uh, you know, something happens in that regard. Losing, your, losing a life in the middle of a contest like that, that's a tragedy. That would have been a disaster. Uh, that's not being hyperbolic at all. But to see that he is healthy and in recovery right now is a very good thing. We've seen the gestures from around the world of wishing him well. We, as to during this contest, we've seen uh, Belgium. They uh, they kicked the ball out 
at the 10 minute mark, he wears number 10 for a, a moment of, uh, for a minute of cheering and solidarity. We see all the signs in the stands and all walks of life and sports and beyond wishing him well. It does put in perspective the your life in general. I've spent the past 45 to 50 minutes on all these things about sports and it really doesn't mean much in comparison to someone's livelihood, their life. Uh, but to see Erickson be able to be healthy or, or in recovery, I should say, and, and credit to the to the medical staff at the stadium and reviving him. I mean, that was just great work uh, by them. They saved a life. Uh, but but as far as on the field, Italy is when, when their first two games, they've looked pretty strong so far uh, as far as this goes. Uh, I think they are they're trying to revive. I mean, we're so used to seeing international tournaments, Italy be a major threat. But they had, didn't qualify for the last for the World Cup. They've been really in a transition period. But they won their first two games. They look very impressive. England won their first game. France has played very well, also. So I think you're looking at these teams that are probably going to be there in the end. We'll see. France is the I think the prohibitive favorite. You look at their roster. I think they can make a run. Belgium. I know they're down one nil right now, but they're a team you got to look at as a major contender. England has a lot of players as well. So it should be a very competitive, uh, you know, uh, European championship. So we'll see what happens there. Copa America, uh, your usual heavy hitters are going to be in that Brazil and Argentina. Those teams have the best rosters. Now, Chile, I know they've won the past couple of Copas, so you can't ignore them. Uh, but I, I think it's a Brazil and Argentina uh, tournament to lose between those, one of those two teams. I know Uruguay usually does well on this stage, uh, but we'll see what happens with those tournaments. It's good to have some international soccer in the summer in competitive tournaments. That's always a fun time.